What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. My name is Michael. Before we get into today's conversation, which is about some of these mythical, uber rare Rolexes, that if you found one, if you found one at a at a at a like junk store, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like because it could happen. These oh, things yeah. happen. It a could, barn yeah. find. You make a quarter of a million bucks, a million bucks, no problem. But there's also a little shade to it, and then I think there's also a way to predict the future with these. Let's so talk it's about very big that. deal. Yes. What are you wearing today? I am wearing my dad's GMT. <laughs> it's very special. No, it's to me. my father's, you know. Uh, <laughs> People thought I was selling my dad's GMT. This is a reference 16700, uh, which is the predecessor to my dad's uh, Rolex uh, GMT. This yep. is a GMT Master, not a GMT Master 2. You also uh, made a really good observation on the podcast on Patreon, yes. not in the 15 minute thing, mm -hmm. but. Your dad's GMT, I always thought aluminum bezels fade because they're aluminum bezels. Mm. But you made a good point of like, no, no, it's the paint because the it's red the is fading, but the blue is staying strong. Yeah, and my dad's blue is even stronger. I know. It's but crazy. That, I was always like, well, it's cool to get aluminum bezels because they fade, but it's like, no, not necessarily. You need you need, you need need aluminum and bad paint. Yes. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny. Which kind of draws us into these watches that we'll get into in a second, but what are you wearing? I'm wearing two Datejust. Uh, the Datejust is the watch that got me kind of into the watch industry. I think that they, they're just amazing, right? They're just incredible value watches. Truly. Um, they are my favorite vintage Rolexes, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I love the 34 millimeter models as well, everybody, but Me the 36 too. millimeter date just are phenomenal. I'm wearing two right now. Uh, they're both very rare, but they have one thing in common, which is um, the, well, I have a couple things in common, but the smooth bezel. Yes. But this one on yes. my right wrist is in two tone. The one on my left wrist is all steel. Left wrist that is, one is, a, insane. is a gilt dial with this like kind of like galaxy stardust kind of look. This is a insane watch that alpha hands this is phenomenal and uh, and then this is just a, a classic two-tone and the uh the bezel here has got some patina all three of these watches all three of these vintage rolexes are available in the theo and harris vintage watch shop um, where we're constantly uploading new cartier rolex tudor uh, all those different sorts of things piaget patek now and again with a couple patek's coming really and, um yeah so uh go take a look at the theo and harris watch shop and now let's begin our conversation yeah i love that watch Okay, so these white dials are getting very, very popular. There are a lot coming up for auction. Mm -hmm. So Hodinkee naturally did an article about it. I'm mm -hmm. assuming Hodinkee and this auction house are being like, okay, let's promote this, let's mm -hmm. promote that. These watches are beautiful. We'll get into the specific watches in a second, mm -hmm. but to kind of open up this conversation, these are white dial Rolexes that you basically never see. They're incredibly hard to find. They were made in very, very limited amounts. There's not even a lot of information about them. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, there is another part of Rolex, a different Rolex type of watch, a different piece of a Rolex, that's also kind of similar, possibly. So can you talk about a Blueberry Rolex? The Blueberry Rolex. Do you see where I'm now going? Now I know where you're going. Yeah. Oh my God. This is a big theory with everything. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we recently launched a Patreon and we're having John Buckley, who is a vintage watch dealing Rolex expert. He is the, the not the inventor, but the, he is John the Buckley. Buckley dial is named after. The yes. famous Buckley dial. We had him on the podcast. The episode's coming up pretty soon. Go ahead and join. The Patreon link is down below. It's a phenomenal episode. All the episodes are great. That's a phenomenal episode. But we dive in to the blueberry bezel. One of the most scandalous possible inserts of all time in terms of bezels. Absolutely right. Now what's scandalous about okay, what it is and then what's scandalous about it. Sure. So what is it? Uh, a blueberry uh, GMT is a Rolex GMT reference 1675. Uh, so a second generation GMT, first generation with the aluminum bezel that has not a Pepsi, not an all black, right? Yep. But uh, not, not a Pepsi, not an all black, not the standard bezels, but a full blue, mm. okay? Is it more beautiful than the Pepsi? I don't actually necessarily feel that way. I yeah, think right. that the Pepsis are absolutely gorgeous. Right. Their mere existence, due to their rarity, if they are real, which is a question that John and I really dive into at great length in the podcast, is what is responsible for their remarkable value. Mm. Um, the watch itself, a 1675 itself, a good one, um, you know, it's around fifteen thousand dollars. It's at somewhere around fifteen thousand dollar watch. Years okay, ago, they sure. were four thousand, but the watches are fifteen thousand around. That's crazy. The bezel insert, a real blueberry bezel insert. Forget the watch. Twenty-five, thirty-five thousand. Oh my god! Yeah, no problem. And, and and more, by the way, <laughs> and more. And that and that's just a little piece of aluminum dyed blue. Sure, sure. But the question is, are they real at all? Well, why don't we ask Rolex? Well, uh, Rolex won't tell you. <laughs> 
there, there, there are no photos um, from Rolex of these of these watches from a catalog. There is no real record of them ever existing. Um, some people have sent their watches with blueberries into Rolex for service, and mm -hmm. the claim is that if Rolex finds something that's not original, they send it back. They, they meaning they won't service. Rolex did, had no objection with it. But okay. that doesn't mean okay. that Rolex had never an oversight. Remember, you remember with Bark and Jack, they sent back say, a watch with yeah. a, a major dial problem. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So the so text was wrong. So it's all very fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is, or the question is, well, how large is the blueberry market? Mm. Right. Because if it's a multi-million dollar market, then there could be a multi-million dollar fraud. Yeah. Right. Uh, and the answer is somewhat nuanced. And we dive into the whole story, you know, with John on the podcast. So go listen to it. But but I'm not going to totally gatekeep. The answer essentially in a nutshell is some people believe, many people believe there are some real ones out there that the blueberry is real, but most blueberries are fake. Watches are unimportant to the time. They can't speed, slow, or stop it, and our phones tell it better. But as vessels for memories, they know few rivals. Because once you see, wow, there's a ton of value doing that, I know a guy that can make a bezel here. Bezel costs what? Pennies. Exactly. It's insane. Boom. You can go on eBay right now and buy a cool bezel insert, cool aftermarket bezel insert. Yeah. I actually bought one for my dad. I, I don't know if he's ever used it. I bought my dad like a totally aftermarket tobacco bezel insert for his GMT just for fun. Yeah. I honestly don't think he ever used it. I don't even know why I bought it. It was just cool, whatever. Yeah, right. And um, and the, 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 my, the point I'm trying to get at is it's a cool bezel. I think I paid 60 bucks for it. It's like... And the guy made money, right? The guy, the guy yeah, probably right. paid 30 or 20 and I paid it for 60 and it's all cool. It's all copacetic, right? A potential profit of $25,000, $35,000, you know? So it's why that is the easiest way to make money in fraud and fake watches. You don't even need to make a watch. You can just make a part. Right. That is fascinating. Exactly. And the whole episode on Patreon that we kind of, that we the way we kind of go from there is that this is one of the reasons why I never really got into high end, like super, super high end watch dealing, right? I kind of stayed in my lane. I stayed under $20,000 for the most part, so far as my Digital X is concerned. Obviously, some AP, some paddocks, I went a little bit over, fine. But I felt more comfortable um, in the less tumultuous waters of quote unquote entry level vintage. Um, because once you're getting into these crazy levels, it is very, very easy to become the victim of fraud. Oh, and yeah. I knew that if I became the victim of fraud and then I then in turn unintentionally committed fraud, although it's, I don't know if it's fraud, if it's unintentional, it, it's difficult. I guess it is fraud. It is probably fraud that I would now have to obviously, if that's ever you're found out, I have to go pay clearly and I would. And now I'm really, you sold you know, four blueberries in seven years. Okay, now, now you owe us one hundred and twenty thousand. Know, exactly on a Wednesday. It's like, yeah, exactly. okay, great, right, <laughs> you know, right, great. So that was you know, it's a it's a great episode. Go ahead and download our Patreon. But it's a phenomenal conversation. Okay, so that being said, there we're not making any claims that these watches are like that, but there is a very rich discussion when we're looking at these albino white dial, whatever you want to call them. There's a lot of discussion of well, how these get made. And Rolex, of course, jumped right in and explained everything and said, oh, well, we're, we're not going to comment. Oh, no, never. No, 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 never. Why is that? Why won't Rolex comment? On anything. <sighs> it's a good, I think it opens up a very dangerous door. Mm. Because once you start commenting, you need to comment on the full gamut. Oh, because and, oh, blueberries aren't real. But what about these white dolls? We don't want to comment. Do you know how many Rolexes are out there? Oh. Rolex is not Paddock. Right now, Paddock is making 60,000 watches a year. You know, you go back to, you know, decades prior, it was a fraction of that, you know. Uh, Rolexes, you're talking about millions of watches. Millions. Can Rolex, how much would Rolex need to spend on infrastructure oh, yeah, right. to even do that? Dig up the history of this watch. Right. Um, and, and, and then also keep in mind when you're talking about Paddock, these watches were always made to be, you know, luxury oh. documented yeah. watches. That was the whole point of getting the whole a point. Like we're, we're pleased to present you with a masterpiece. Here is everything. That we will always have record of. Because you pass it down to your son. We expect you to do this. Rolex is like, 
Do you, you want another one? You didn't beat it up already? You, you didn't yeah. break it? You're right. sending this back to... Why? Throw it in the garbage. Yeah, like, right, not, right. Not that it's thrown in the garbage. Yeah, the watches were always meant to be heirlooms, but they weren't meant to be collectible necessarily at any point, right? right. The Rolex story is a, is a story in many ways of intentional market success and almost unintentional... Like, uh, to the degree that it became a collector's item... I think it was almost unintentional. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. I mean, Rolexes are more valuable than Paddocks. And that was never supposed to be the point. That never. Was, which is funny because that's why it hit off. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, that's... Like, the Paddock is the Paddock. You wrote down when you wrote the brand, these are going to be the best watches in the entire Totally. Time. Rolex was like, no, these are supposed to be the best tool watches. And the common, or like the general world was like, oh, that's awesome. Totally. That's, it's not supposed to do this, but it did. Because it, appeal, it appeals to more people, right? The, the right. idea of beat it up, you know, explore style, you know, is is very cool. I mean, it's something that is, it's inspiring. Look at the, it's like Walter Mitty, right? Walter Mitty's not wearing a Calatrava, right? He's wearing exactly. an Explorer, you know? Exactly. We all, even the even even the you know paddock guys, even the desk guys, the guys that are making a ton of money and super uptight, you know, uptight and polished. Yeah, you know, do they daydream about about their? Do they daydream about their current life, or are they also wishing on a level that they were you know hiking or scaling a mountain in Nepal? I mean, who's not yeah. poetic about yeah. that sort of life or <laughs> catching sharks like Hemingway or, or Marlin for that matter? something cool about that. There's also mm -hmm. the same thing with, even in, if we're just talking about inside of Paddock, and then we'll get back to the subject at hand, but talking inside of Paddock, there's the guy that wears the Paddock on his way to his big office job in the city, mm -hmm. and then there's the guy you imagine that wears his Paddock doing something else, doing something a bit more like grand. Totally. And you're like, oh, well, that's not even that Paddock. Totally. You know, I, I mean, again, I know we're being tangential, but I think that, I think that this is a good conversation, but there is something... <laughs> Well, you can you can look at any of these lives and say that's pretty cool. And there's something cool sure. about the guy that wears a Patek Calatrava to everything and never takes it off. Very cool. Of course. There's something very cool about, like we said, about like a fisherman, like like your dad that would wear something that is, you know, a day date. Like if your dad wore a yeah, day date right. every day for the last 35 fucking years, that would have been the coolest day date in the world. Exactly. Beat to hell, covered in scales, scratches. Covered in scales. You know, right. it's a like, you know my dad point. showers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like barnacles everywhere. Yeah. But there is something to be said about a guy that, you know, wears his wears his paddock every day to work, right? Comes home, throws on his Rolex to play with his kids. Yep. Right? That's a cool, there's a dichotomy there that's really interesting. I think in, in more real life, like where they're Nautilus when they got home, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, I digress. Obviously, these watches are incredibly rare and they're incredibly valuable, but the the value is only realized if there's a level of awareness, right? Of course, yeah. If these watches remain in a barn, you know, they're, they're not going to be they're really worth yeah, anything. Course, I don't care what it is, right? Yeah. But when these watches go to auction, right, then they are able to realize their actual global value. You have multiple bidders. You have you know, the, the, the guys in the world. I mean, exactly. It's like if you are, you know, you go into a house in this farm and you see a painting by ah, a very famous painter. Yes, that's right. And, and on that note, this video is sponsored by Masterworks. Yes. Masterworks is essentially the culmination of, of of, of brilliant technology mm -hmm. and, and art curation, right? right? It's democratizing the art investment world, uh, which is right. a world that has grown exponentially. It has been around forever, but was really the highest level of investing that you can get into. You can't afford a $5 million painting on your own it's, unless you're massive, it's, your wealth it's, is substantial. First of all, it's far older than watches, as we know. The watch auction market is, uh, is in its infancy. Compared when was to art created? When was the first wristwatch it's, created? You can't, even, you can't even compare these things. <laughs> You know, uh, they have to be at least fifty years apart. <laughs> and yes, the the barrier, the 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 entry point in art is just completely ridiculous. You can actually get into watch collecting at a fairly approachable price point. You know, relatively of course, speaking. Yeah, yeah. When I go to these watch auctions, you can get stuff in the fifty thousand dollar range, hundred thousand dollar range. When we go to art auctions, which are always next door to the watch auctions within the same auction kind of you know, houses, um, you're talking about you know millions of dollars is cheap. The it's bidding art. starts at a record level Daytona. Oh, Oh, exactly. 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 That's why when art collectors look at the watch, you know, kind of market, they're like, oh, that's adorable. You exactly, know, relatively exactly. speaking to their market, which is just completely unattainable. So what has Masterworks done? Masterworks has, well, first off, they have over 650,000 users already. Mm -hmm. And there's a wait list, but you can skip the line if you listen in a second. But they have over $740 million invested in more than 140 offerings. Mm -hmm. And they're all SEC qualified offerings. So you can find Masterworks filings at sec.gov and linked in the description show notes below. But they've had 
had 13 sales to date, nine of them in 2022 alone. Unbelievable. So basically what it is, is it's democratized art investment world, right? Because naturally most of us can't come up with, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 million dollars in cash to buy a painting. Of course. Um, or, or even if you can, not necessarily interested in doing that, right? You want to get your feet wet um, through fractional ownership, right? Through buying functionally shares in that piece of art, buying a portion of that um, investment is possible through Masterworks. Exactly. Right? And that's the brilliance of it, right? They're yeah. basically saying this is a wild, raging market. Why should we only offer it to those that can afford the entire piece or interested in it? Why don't we offer it to everybody? That's Masterworks. Exactly. And 2022 was the best auction year ever. There was the highest total from the big three auction houses, nearly $18 billion. Insane. So if you want to skip the line and join this over 650,000 people, you can check out the link in our description below. Terrific. Thank you to Masterworks for sponsoring today's video and uh, back into our bios. Before we get into those specific watches going up for auction, this is Sir Edmund Hillary's The Pre-Explorer Explorer. What do you notice about this watch when you're looking at it? Just overview, what do you see? Talking about dial specifically. Um, well, obviously, it's, it's a white dial. It looks like a standard OP because it is a standard OP. This was not an Explorer. The right. Explorer collection was built on the back of this commercial success, right? This famous event. There was no Explorer. Which he is, was the Explorer. Which is really funny when you think about that. Like, this is just an OP. Yeah. And it's like... No, if you want the original Explorer, you can get these watches. Oh, yeah. You can get them easily. Yeah. But people can. will say, first ever Explorer, and you're like, well, that's Sir Edmund Hillary's. It's like, no, no, no. That's right. the first watch kind of made off the back of his marketing. Right. Exactly. But right. what do you see? Talk about hands, talk about indices. Yeah, well, you have alpha hands, you have radium, you've got these, uh, you get these, these triangle, uh, you know, uh, hour, you know, markers, uh, you, have, you know, radium burn everywhere too. You have red text. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got a little, the half crown. I mean, you've got things that are, are, are decidedly 1950s Rolex. Yes. And very importantly, it's a white dial. It's a white right? dial. Which you'd think, okay, logically going up in the snow, that's probably not the easiest thing to see, but mm. who knows? I haven't been on Mount Everest or anything like that. So... Now we go over to this Explorer, mm -hmm. which is the white dial Explorer. Yeah. Do you see anything different? And I'm talking really about, okay, this is now the Explorer's watch. Is it easier or harder to go up a mountain with a white dial watch with dramatically less contrast? Oh, I mean, if we're talking purely about the functionality of the watch, yes, this is a harder watch to view. Yes, this is a harder watch to read. Okay, perfect. Then we get to an albino 66110 with a red depth rating at 12 o'clock, which, as you know, that red depth rating is on my grail list of Rolexes to get. Mm -hmm. That is really, that's the masterpiece in watches that you'll never be able to get. Mm -hmm. This watch has been patinaed, it's tropical, but you'll notice that the numbers are outlined in black, the indices. Slightly more legible. Slightly more legible. And this is an earlier watch, too. This is an earlier watch, yeah. yes. So now we get into the discussion, the earliest discussion. Do you think, one, these are original parts? Mm -hmm. Do you think they're modded? Or do you think it was a radical, so, so tropical, all of the color is gone? Which is one of the theories, too. And this includes the GMT, this includes the Samariner, this yeah. includes the Explorer. I definitely don't think that. I don't think that that's... I think you ruled that out right away. Yeah, you ruled that out right away. Um, I mean, even the text itself being black, right? I mean, yeah. that, that would rule it out. Do I, think that, do I think that albino dial Rolexes are real? Yes. Similar to the Blueberry situation, I think there are genuine albinos out there, uh, particularly in the Explorer world, and that we know that that is, that that is true. Yes. It becomes a little bit, a little less validated once you go into the GMT world, the Samariner world. We know less about that. Okay. You know, okay. not to sure. say that they're fake. They're, they're, these watches are... I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying that at all, right? I'm of course. not making that allegation. Um, uh, but um, that doesn't mean that all of albinos are real. That doesn't mean that that everything out there, uh, just because there is one, doesn't mean that every one is original, mm -hmm. right? Now, modded is a great question. Well, what does modded mean? And means, when does modded mean? Uh, yes. So modded means, obviously, it's modified. The watch has been modified. Well, okay. Uh can a watch be modified with original parts, with correct parts? It's another conversation that John Buckley and I got into on the podcast, on Patreon. Interesting. Like, what does original mean? What does correct mean? All these different, all these words mean a lot. Taylor's it, mom's watch. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. Exa exactly right. Great, great point. All these watches mean very different things. Uh, all these words rather mean very different things. Um, if, a, if a dial is original and a case is original, these are all original Rolex parts, the bracelet and everything. But someone at some point, okay, 
um, took a dial from one watch and a case from another watch and put them together, right? Meaning the best dial, the best case, put them together. We, if so long as the parts are correct, so long as they were manufactured in the same serial number range, so it would have happened, you know, at the same time, a, a retail buyer or anyone, anyone, an ex, any expert would have no idea. There, it would be impossible to tell you. You can't impossible. tell. Rolex won't comment on it. They made millions of watches. Millions of watches. Rolex millions. themselves couldn't know. Yeah, they, they, exactly. They, 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 they only on, I believe, American papers in a certain period of time did Rolex on their original papers put a dial code. Right. Otherwise, and take those papers and throw them out, and I don't even think that you could know that then. Yeah, know? right. So, so that's uh, not the that point. That Rolex has a centralized data on that. That's not know? the point of the brand. Not the point of the brand. So now that does not mean that that does not that's not a bad thing. If it's an original dial, an original case, and and everything is original and correct of the same period and of the same reference and of the same serial range, and you put them together to make a super watch, you know, it may sound bad, but I as a collector would do it. Interesting. I've never because like for here's a good example. Okay. My date just. Yep. Perfect dial. Yes. Good case. Good case. Not yep. perfect. Yep. I could buy a new case or, or I could buy, I could just swap, right? I could do that. Yeah, right. I don't because I'm nostalgic. I like my case. Yeah, right. I, I don't I don't want a super watch. Right? You know, yeah, what I mean? right, like right. I, you know, I just like I don't know, I'm not that guy. You want an unpolished case mixed with the dial because it's then it's not the watch that you got. Exactly. Your first watch, it's no right. longer my first watch. You right. know, I, I modded the crystal, I swapped out for a little while, but That's I don't think crystal, that looked right, it so right. much. But um but yeah, so it's not necessarily something that I it's not something I have done, not something I will do personally, but something I totally Totally could conceive of doing right. Mm -hmm. I always say I would love to buy a. I would love to buy a Submariner, right? Yes. Let's say even say in steel. Okay? okay. Sure. I'd love to send a steel Submariner to a, 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 a you know case maker. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have bevels put on it. Okay. I'd love to have crown guards removed. Yep. Have a large crown put in. Yeah. Have a have a have have a, a custard put all over the dial on, on the loom. Yep. And I'd like to have a washed out bezel. I could probably do that for you mean all mods in an extra two grand. So now I take a let's say a seven thousand dollar Rolex because head only I wouldn't sure, do bracelet. Take a seven thousand dollar Rolex, put two grand into it. I have my perfect nine thousand dollar sub, which is still less than a sub in the store. Right. I don't know. That's something I would do, and that's, that's cool. all modded. That's not even original. But right. so I'm not. I'm not saying to be a total. You know, to be honest with yourself about what you would do so far as modding. Yeah. Um. But we could never know if these watches are modded or not. It, it, it's impossible. It just it could never happen. Yeah. Right. So, you go with what theory or what line of th not even theory because it sounds very uh, conspiracy based. But yeah. What are your thoughts? I, I think that it is. It is incredibly likely because this continued to happen. First of all, it's human nature, and second of all, it continued to happen at Rolex up until you know, not that long ago. Um, certain people, namely Rolex executives, friends of the brand, yeah. would request uh, you know dials in, in in a different or different configuration. Yeah. Recently, an all platinum uh, yacht master sold at auction for a ton of money. The watch was never serially produced. Um, but they were made. Mm -hmm. There were rumors that the GMT Masters in white uh, were 1670, uh, uh, 6542 reference, the first reference of the GMT. Mm -hmm. There were rumors that those watches were made specifically for Pan Am executives. Is that true? I don't know. Right. Is it completely plausible? Yeah. Every, everyone else can buy the black, but the executives get the white. Rolex will put a Domino's executives. logo on a watch. They'll put a gasoline logo on a watch. So they'll, put, this. So they'll put a white dot. Yeah. Exactly. My thoughts exactly. And even less in depth than that, at this time in Rolex's history, they were a lot more adventurous. They wouldn't do just a straight watch. They, you know, they basically started off with crazy dials, honeycomb dials, roulette wheels, and then they kind of just cold everything down to be like, this is the Rolex watch. Totally. So to me, that part doesn't even seem that crazy. And it could just come down to like, I don't know, they didn't really sell in the store. We did an initial run and then cut it or, you know, something of that sort. But this era of Rolex is not that crazy to, to do th things yeah. like this. It happened back then. They, you know, they were a little bit more experimental. They were f***ing around. It's cool. I, yeah. You know, now the question is, you know, what take take the hype out of it. Sure. Are these is that more beautiful than a standard of the same reference in black? I uh, is gilt more beautiful. What do you think is more beautiful? Oh, this all day. I, I want a white dial watch, and I don't want a modern white dial watch, which tends to have like silver in it, which tends to be sunburst mm -hmm. or something like that. This looks like. 
an artist got an old piece of like paper, mm. drew it and put it on the watch and yeah. was like, it's gonna burn in the sun, it's gonna do this, it's gonna yeah. do that. Yeah. That to me is unreal. Yeah, I, I definitely take the white dial Explorer over the GMT. I actually don't love the GMT. Oh, uh, that's a good point. I was not thinking about GMT or yeah. sub. GMT or sub, eh. Yeah, and it, which brings us to the you know second uh, the the final portion of the conversation, which is if you fast forward to modern, right? I, this is this I have a trick on my sleeve. Oh, here. I'm sorry. No, no, yeah, go yeah, on, no, go on. Check up your sleeve. <laughs> Into the modern world, Rolex through Rolex and Tudor have reintroduced these albino dials, um, both in their GMT collection. Uh, I think exclusively in their GMT collection. Uh, one with Tudor and a standard Black Bay GMT, and then one with Rolex and their GMT Master Two, but not with a white dial, but with a white colored basically silver white yep, meteorite yep. and it just comes down to what do you find more beautiful the yeah. standard blacks or do you find it better in white when i was buying my white gold gmt mm -hmm. um um i was kind of getting peer pressured into getting meteorite because it's more special well because your watch is made of white gold right <laughs> uh, some people were like you're gonna do the meteorite right i mean it's 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 better and i'm like no i i actually i think it's great it's super cool like if you've got it kudos yeah. great watch but i was like no i actually like the black i actually quite like the black yeah i actually i think meteorite's cool awesome great i would like a flat white dial over mm -hmm. there but there therein lies the rub my friend mm -hmm. so tudor released the opaline dial mm -hmm. gmt Hodinki, they did an article recently just about the white GMT because Tudor released theirs. And now they have this big article where all of these white dial watches are going to auction. Mm -hmm. It's very in-depth. It's kind of the highlighted article right now. What's the deal with albino Rolex dials? Mm -hmm. XYZ. Mm -hmm. In my perspective, this seems very much like a marketing cannon fire waiting to pull. Mm. Such as when Tudor started releasing a lot of things in titanium, they made the smaller Pelagos and stuff. It was like, okay... There's probably something else coming in titanium, mm -hmm. and we're warming the waters. We're making sure no one's diving in cold. Oh, Do you see any future, any future coming here in Tudor or Rolex? Because I think I do, but I don't know how much. Oh, I could see like the new Black Bay 57 or the 54, whatever the f*** it's called. 54? Yeah. yeah. I could see that coming out in white. Easily. No problem. Easily. Will Rolex do something That's in white? That's the big question. I don't know. I mean, nothing's impossible, clearly. Right. Of course. Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you see. Yeah, maybe you do. I didn't even think about that. That, that would be fascinating. That's, and again, it's a very, I don't know how the marketing machine works behind Rolex and Tudor, but it is a very like watch released article, article references, old GMT, mm -hmm. little time goes on. Big auction comes up, all Rolex pieces that were white. Then what? Is that the end of the chain or is that the beginning of the chain? Right. Well, Rolex always, you know, delays you, right? Rolex of always, course, yeah. you know, really, Rolex really understands you don't put out on the first date, right? Yeah. Um, they really get that. They're like, you know, they keep you wanting for years, which is maybe a little <laughs> dramatic, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, you know, but uh, but they really do. I mean, look at the look at the Pepsi, the reintroduction of the Pepsi took. It took almost ten years. I mean, yeah, something right. like that. Eight, right. 2008, 2014, and then not only not until not in steel for another couple of years. It was crazy. You know, the the Daytona, the same thing. And people were begging for a ceramic Daytona a Panda. That yeah, right, right, right. So, so yeah, I could definitely see it happening. I think Tudor will do it sooner. Oh, of Tudor course, will of do course. it. You know. Well, Tudor, Tudor's the you know, if buyers are sharks. Tudor is the bait. Or like the chum where totally. Rolex is like, yeah, put that white down GMT. Totally. Does it sell well? All right. Yeah. We won't do anything about that yet, but we will think about that. Totally. Totally. So, so yeah. two final questions for you. Yes. One, do you think, just pie in the sky, Rolex will do something like a white explorer, white sub? In, you give yourself a time frame. Um, I think that we will see it within the next five years. If I really, if we were like if doing under, if you did under over three, now that becomes competitive. Right. Like, Five is safe. Under over three, I might go under. That's aggressive. I could see. I could see them doing because because every year when people do like the Rolex predictions, sure. people have been asking or predicting a, a white dial explorer. You know, mm -hmm. but I really saw nothing in the press that alluded to the fact that Rolex was chumming the water for that. Of course. So that's a good point. Now that you're making me look at it from that lens, I think that you're right. Uh, people have been asking for it, but right. there's been no teasing. It's a little bit of a tease. Because what's better marketing than this Explorer selling for a record amount of totally. any Explorer? This totally. is the best Explorer totally. ever. They don't make them like this or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Then the final question is, do you think it is all one big marketing effort or do you think it's just by chance? Hodinkee's like, oh, this is a great topic. We'll just kind of oh, open I think it it's a, I think it's. I think it's a very 
delicately played but very large marketing effort always. Um, I, now here's my question follow up for you. Yes. Do you think that Rolex will ever release in the, you know, in the future, yeah. ever release a watch not along with the rest of their collection, but at a separate time in the year. Will we ever oh. wake up in the morning to a new Rolex dropping out of nowhere? That's a great question. I'd say, yeah. What if every year Rolex picked a different day? You can never expect it. That would be insane. Where you wake up and they break the internet. That would be nuts. Nuts. In the watch world? That just be- one. Yeah, just one. And they don't even say anything about it. It's just on the website. It's on the website. Oh yeah, that would be nuts. God. They don't tease it. No, nothing. 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 The, op- the Explorer, all of a sudden, there's just an option for white dial. Do you know how many... I don't want to make up a number here, but... Danny Milton would poop himself. <laughs> Danny Milton would stink that day at work. Dozens of millions of dollars in free advertising, that would be. Oh. I mean, the world would go fucking bananas. Oh, yeah. And no one else could do it to that degree. No, right, right. right. Paddock does two releases a year, always. Um, you know, and it, and it does a lot, but, but the element of surprise there, it's like Dwight and Jim with the, with the snowball. Fight, <laughs> yeah, you know? It's, not, it's yeah. just like, we're always wondering if Rolex is going to hit us with a snowball. And that in this be, instance, it would be a snowball. That would be, check out the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's the thoughts Terrific on Terrific conversation, my man. I love talking about vintage Rolex. It's, 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 it's such a fascinating conversation because it's so like, you have to be very careful what you say because the answers are never very certain. You yeah, know? true. But um, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, take a look at the Theo and Harris Watch Shop if you're interested in any of these vintage Rolexes on our wrists. And um, of course, join our community on Patreon. We're doing podcasts every week, lives every month, um, meetups every quarter, and engagement always.